My distinct privilege to introduce the president of our university, Frank T. Brogan. President Brogan and I have, to his dismay, served together in several capacities. Um, we all have um, an obstruction to our career, and I've been his obstruction over the years. Um, I first met him when he was superintendent of Martin County. He came to that position having worked with fifth graders in a classroom, been in school leadership, and been superintendent of Martin County. And one of the reasons that we in the department, which is where I was then, I also created obstructions there, um, wanted to have him come to, the, to Tallahassee and talk with because he spoke from the heart, spoke from the mind, spoke from his experience with students. And so he liked it. And pretty soon we turned around and he was Commissioner of Education. Um, and again, that was, a, that was a wonderful growth time during the, the time we were there in Tallahassee together. He became Lieutenant Governor. At that point, I went over and began to work with Florida State University School, came back into his office, received some pretty direct counsel, as he is off on to give. Um, he thought he was through with me when I moved to uh, Florida Atlantic University. And then, lo and behold, I'm in the Treasure Coast, and Jerry McPherson, who was the vice president there, said, come on, I want you to walk into this interview session. Well, I don't normally go to interview sessions unless it's somebody that's going to be working for me. And I looked across the table, and we both just had to look at each other and laugh, uh, because the man who was going to the interview session was Fred Brody. Um, he, uh, unfortunately, has had to spend some time with me. But despite that, he has, he has agreed to come and talk to you about some thoughts that he has. And with that, I'd like to welcome um, a professional colleague, my boss, the boss of a lot of us here, um, <laughs> President Frank T. Brogan. back at Florida Atlantic University, Slattery at Anderson. It is too darn quiet around here during the summertime. Uh, the people who know me best will tell you that I just get a little crazy during the summer, during spring break, during, uh, during the Christmas holidays. Um, I've done this for 30 years, and I do it for one reason and one reason only, and it's the excitement that goes along with being around the students. They're fantastic. Before I start talking about Henderson, just uh, a quick commercial message about Florida Atlantic University. We are, uh, we opened up with a record number of students. Uh, that's a little different than you might find in some state universities because of the budget reductions, but we uh, got to just uh, about 40, I think, under 27,000 students, which is an all-time high for Florida Atlantic University. Uh, another tidbit, uh, we took in 11,000 applications for 2,500 slots at FAU for this fall term, which is a record for us. That's uh, up over about 1,200 last year at the same time. It's, it's exploded. Uh, my biggest problem, and, and the one that uh, I guess is nice to have because it proves something to you, and yet you've still got the problem, is the fact that we opened the year with a waiting list to get into student housing of a little under 500. Uh, that's an all-time high for us as well. But, it shows that our move to not only continue to be a great access university with all these campuses stretched over uh, Southeast Florida, but also our drive to increase the traditional side of Florida Atlantic University is paying off. This past year, we had a couple of uh, remarkable, what I call shoulder tapping opportunities. I call them shoulder tapping because you tap people on the shoulder, but when they turn around, you really need to have something to show them. And if you stop and consider this year, we hosted the nationally televised uh, Republican presidential debates. Almost had the, the Democrats on Sunday, but that didn't work out. But we were on MSNBC, not just that night, but for the entire week, had the nation's attention. And everything was broadcasting from here. It was remarkable how many households Florida Atlantic University ended up being in before that week was concluded. And then, of course, uh, we went off and not only won our football conference, but uh, we're the only team playing on Friday night during the uh, bowl season against the University of Memphis. The team's been playing football for about 100 years, and of course, we've been at it for just a little less than that, seven. <laughs> <laughs> and ended up with, winning the New Orleans Bowl uh, on national television, the ESPN, in front of about 8 million households uh, in, in the United States. Now, those were two amazing shoulder tappers. 
But the beauty again is when people turned around, most of them for the first time, and said, so who's Florida Atlantic University? What they found upon closer and further review was an amazing university that is now uh, a large university. Most people don't know that. I, I suppose because Florida is a funny state. We have 11 state universities, and we go all the way up to Florida, which has uh, over 50,000 students. So we think 27,000 is about average size. On a national scale, we're a very large university. Most universities are not this big. But we're also a university that has uh, a growing reputation in the world. Undergraduate programs, graduate programs, and our research work has taken off with a vengeance uh, over the last half dozen years. It's been very exciting. And then as I say, with our push to increase the traditional visibility of the university, how do you do that? Well, you, you put greater emphasis on undergraduate programs. You build more student housing. And we have now about 2,500 students who live on this campus. That will go to 5,000 just in the next several years with two new rounds of student housing. As I said before, not only needed, but overdue. And we're getting ready to start those. Uh, you build football stadiums. Because not only do the traditional students want the university experience, so do the commuter students. Uh, they don't want to be shorted just because they're commuter students. They want the same kind of exciting university experience that all students have. You build fitness centers, and boy, if you haven't been on the north end of campus, uh, the eighth wonder of the world is going up over there now, and that is phase one of the new fitness center, which will be completed January 1st, and before that's completed, phase two will be size of a swimming pool for faculty, staff, and uh, students. It's going to be remarkable. And that's what students want nowadays. They want the amenities that go along with the university experience. Our new alumni center, our first uh, in the brief history of this university, is all but completed and the furniture is on its way and that will be open in time for our homecoming football game. So our alumni will now for the first time have a, a center of focus, an opportunity to uh, come back to campus and be at the Alumni Center, get excited about what we're doing here, which will increase our success with our alumni base. Now over about 10,000 alumni at Florida Atlantic University. Brand new College of Engineering, uh, we are getting ready to start in the next several months. Uh, that will be just next to our Biomedical Science Building. And uh, we're going to be truly focusing in the future, not only on the life sciences, the world of biomedical science, but also on bioengineering, which goes hand in hand with the soft sciences in that regard. Now that we've added uh, the Scripps Institute, now that we've uh, added right now as we speak, uh, Max Planck, which is another international renowned research institute on our Jupiter campus, Torrey Pines Research Institute on our Treasure Coast campus where I'll be all day tomorrow. All of these and more have created a new excitement in the world of high-paced uh, research that will bring, again, tremendous notoriety Florida Atlantic University, but also unbridled opportunity for faculty and students at every level, not just uh, graduate, but also undergraduates, <laughs> are going to be able to enjoy a lot of these great things. So it's, it's a marvelous ride that the university is on right now. Uh, we really are gaining a, a, true, a true and excellent reputation on a national and even international scale. Uh, Florida Atlantic University is uh, one of the most diversely populated, and we believe the most diversely populated student body in the state university system. Over 40% of our students are categorized as minority students. Many of them are first timers in college in their family history. And many of them uh, come from countries in over 140 countries uh, from around the, the face of the earth. So it's an incredibly diverse student population, which again adds to the excitement, the electricity. I always say to my aspiring parents of my aspiring students, Come to FAU, you'll get two educations for the price of one. The first one you'll pay for, that's the academic education. The second one will be a cultural experience that will serve you enormously well when you graduate and go out there into that global economy. The fact that you learned elbow to elbow with people from all over the world will really be a great benefit to you. You'll take it naturally, as our students do. So they just take it for granted that everybody in their classroom is different color, different religions, different backgrounds, cultures, native tongues, but how well that serves them when they go out there in the job market, because now they are comfortable in that diverse environment. And of course, as our world keeps getting smaller and smaller, that's an important component of it. So these are truly amazing times uh, at FAU, and our university continues to grow.
grow up as a family, everything largely I've talked about is on the boat campus. We're about to start a new building on our dating campus this year. We will uh, considerably expand our reach uh, in the Broward County area where we have uh, three sites. Uh, we, the Jupiter campus I talked about, uh, if you haven't been there, you ever get 10 minutes and you're driving up by 95, when you get to Donald Ross Road, which is just north of PGA Boulevard, just hook a right, get off and take a quick left, and you will be at the Jupiter campus, and you will see the 380,000 square feet facility that Swift is just finishing. They will move into that, and we will move into 75,000 square feet of state-of-the-art research facility. Mox Plum is about to begin construction of 100,000 square feet. FAU will have 10,000 of those square feet at our disposal for research space and office space. And that's including all the rest of the great things that are going on there. Further north, of course, is the Port St. Lucie campus. And uh, we are building right now, soon to be finished, a brand new building there that will double our capacity in Port St. Lucie for undergraduate and graduate programming. And then we just added to the complement of FAU the Harbor Branch Oceanographic Institute, which is a world class marine research ocean engineering program that will work with our SeaTac partners down in Dania Beach and really make us a premier university in the world of all things marine research, ocean engineering, and truly provide some academic opportunities for students and faculty that are breathtaking. Uh, our guys down at SeaTac uh, received uh, multi-millions of dollars to probe the Florida Gulf Stream for energy purposes. The idea is to take, um, some of you might either be from the Northeast or that family in the Northeast where you now see the turbines on the horizon that are turned by wind and they create electricity. Similar principle, only moored on the bottom of a thousand feet of water in the Florida Gulf Stream so that the turbines would be turned by the power of the Florida Gulf Stream. The beauty is it never stops. Wind slows down and stops. Sun goes behind clouds. The Florida Gulf Stream goes 24-7. It never stops and can provide clean, environmentally friendly power back to uh, shore. And that's, that's an idea of what's going on there. We're also very deep into research for uh, cures and treatments for cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, cardiovascular disease. The university has really got an impressive portfolio of biomedical, biotechnical research in which we're engaged today. We also uh, are doing great work in the world of pre-K through 12 education. We are so excited, the dean is here tonight, we're so excited that we are beginning uh, a baccalaureate degree in the world's early childhood education uh, with the pre-kindergarten constitutional initiative that now provides voluntary universal pre-kindergarten services to all four-year-olds in the state of Florida. Well, that's a great boon, they're gonna need teachers, not babysitters. This is readiness. This is not just dropping kids off and saying, I'll see you after work, you know, make sure I get him back in the same condition I left him. The idea here is they need teachers who are skilled in how to work with early childhood methodologies and strategies. And Florida Atlantic University, I'm convinced, not only with new programs, but the money that's been donated by the Topol family to build a brand new building located right between Slattery and Henderson. Uh, will be the home for what we believe will be a mecca for all things early childhood education and research. And we're very excited about that. But it doesn't stop there. We're doing great work in the area of K through 12. That includes, obviously, Slattery, Henderson. Uh, now with the addition of the high school program at Henderson, we're very proud of that. Uh, while it's small, by design, it is capturing the attention of many to see how can we add the opportunity for more and more students to do dual enrollment programming with universities, but create a support system around them so we're not just throwing them out there and saying to that 16-year-old, lots of work, <coughs> and only providing it to students who've already demonstrated a capacity to do it. We want to reach that, but we also want to reach the students that oftentimes the guidance counselors overlook. The ones that they might look at and say, you know, maybe, Oh, but I, I'm not sure if he or she will survive in that environment without a support structure. That's what we're trying to put together at Henderson, is an exciting support structure so that more and more young people, you know those who are walking around their high school year, this will sound familiar to some of you, their senior year in high school, taking three study halls because they've taken it all, uh, but they've got to finish their senior year in high school. We want those kids. 
We need those kids, and more, they ought to be here taking university coursework and acquiring credits for their baccalaureate degree. So often they need a support system because they're not yet ready for a university. But with that support network that we're trying to build here in laboratory form, more and more of them could do that. And again, more and more students who may be left out of the equation because they don't look the part or because they typically don't fit the profile of the classic dual enrollment student. So we are incredibly proud of what's going on here in our high school program. Uh, know that as the classes build a little bit each year, we wanted to crawl before we walk. We didn't we want to move too quickly and too fast. As we research the, this thing, I am convinced with our great faculty here, we're going to demonstrate that more and more young people can have the opportunity to a dual enrollment experience. If you stop and think about our graduates from last year, some of them graduating uh, with 80 credit hours for a 120 credit hour baccalaureate degree. So when they start as a freshman, two semesters, they're finished. And they're on to their graduate. It's, a, it's an incredible opportunity, and we're pushing that here. Of course, up on the Treasure Coast, we have just started a new partnership with a charter lab school. This is a different uh, governance structure. This is a classic developmental research school at A.B. Henderson, created in the original statute. Years later, the statute was tweaked to allow other entities besides school boards to work with laboratory schools. In this particular case, we are partnered with the St. Lucie County Schools, Florida Atlantic University, who provides some oversight of the research, and we have now a K through 12 school, brand new, built in the traditions development. If you go north on 95, lay up that leg, and you look off to the left as you get near Port St. Lucie, there's a big new development called Traditions, Planned Development Community. But it's not for the uh, necessarily the, the children who live in Traditions. They come from all over St. Lucie County. Very important. We'll talk more about why that's important in just a moment. And there's going to be great things going on there. And of course, we've got the new Pine Jog Partnership in Palm Beach County. Pine Jog, uh, in case you didn't know, is a parcel of property in western Palm Beach County uh, that Florida Atlantic University has overseen for purposes of, of uh, uh, eco-tours, uh, edu environmental education programs. There were some old uh, block buildings on the site that we used to provide uh, environmental education programs to teachers so that they could get uh, advanced degrees, et cetera. We partnered with the Palm Beach County Schools uh, who came along and said, we'd like to build an elementary school on that property, about 15 acres of it, frontage. Instead of just an elementary school, we sat down and talked and said, why not an elementary school that has a, a continuous environmental education program strand that runs through every grade level? Why not do special training for the faculty on how to teach environmental education? And a wrinkle I love, which is why not bring faculty members from other schools around Palm Beach County, allow them to teach there for a year, go through these programs, leave with a master's degree from Florida Atlantic University and go back to their sending school and become a teacher of teachers so that you can expand this thing to a greater degree. And it is an amazing uh, program. It's an amazing facility. It will be Silver LEED certified with the environmental certification assigned to buildings in the state of Florida. So they walk it, talk it, and uh, it will be a part of everything that they do up at Pine Job. Another great partnership in the world of K-12. And I, I could go on and on, but I, I say that because it's important, at least to me, that people understand that, yes, we turn out great undergraduate and graduate students with degrees. That's what we do. But we also do so many things in partnership with community organizations and members because that's a big part of our mission as well. Our faculty will tell you it's all about teaching, research, and service, and the combination of those three that we do what we we're really excited about what's happening at FAU, and of course we now have the medical education program, and we just took in the first group of students that will now do their entire four years of medical school right here on the Boca Raton campus at Fort Atlantic University. And then many, we hope, will stay and do their residency work in some of our affiliate hospitals in this part of Florida. And the beautiful part of the residency program is all the research indicates that where people do their residency, they are far more inclined to stay there and practice. So instead of training doctors to go off to everywhere else, the idea is you combine the medical ed program with the residency program, you're training
bringing in large measure doctors who will be your doctors and my doctors in this area of the world, which is, which is even more exciting. Um, this particular institution has a long and illustrious history and is a full-fledged part of Florida Atlantic University. How do I know? Because every time a hurricane comes and the university closes, you close too. It's <laughs> Pretty no, it's an amazing partnership that has existed. This is one of four uh, charter or four developmental research schools that exist in the state of Florida. And I probably am safe in saying this, Glenn, uh, that presidents probably get to those other three uh, from time to time. Uh, because of my background, um, I get very involved in Henderson because I think what we're doing here has transference properties to other schools in other places. The idea of a, of a research school, a laboratory school, as it's often called, is not just to do great things with the boys and girls who are there, but to study the results, to look at the strategies, to find innovations and creative opportunities that were once chronicled, transfer to schools anyway who have similar uh, groups of boys and girls, in elementary school, middle school, and now high school. So the idea is to do great things for the students who are there, but also to use those great things as a way to leverage great things for boys and girls and teachers in other locales. That's really the fundamental principles upon which uh, a developmental research school are built, and you do that by partnering with a university. So tonight is for purposes of getting uh, me back in the classroom more than anything else. So sit up straight and pay attention. Stop reading that book. Um, <laughs> That's great if your child happens to go to a great school. It's a problem if your child doesn't, because you're there. In this particular case, and probably for as many reasons as there are faces in the audience tonight, mothers and fathers, family members have made a profound decision for their sons and daughters that Henderson would be their school of choice. And that is, before anything else is said, a tremendous combination of uh, A.D. Henderson fact that you would entrust your children to this school when nobody's making them do it. How do I know that? Tomorrow if you left and went back to a school in Palm Beach County or Broward County, there would be by law a seat waiting there for your son and daughter with their name on it. And they'd have to take them tomorrow. Here, you've made that decision. And it really is an important one, obviously. I'm not sure that there are many more important decisions for a mother and father than the educational opportunity that their sons and daughters will enjoy. So I can't tell you how proud we are of the fact that for whatever reason, and there may be nuances, you've chosen A.D. Henderson, and therefore Florida Atlantic University for the education of your child. Um, and I think it's a wise choice. I'm giving you that not only as president, I'm giving you that as somebody who walks these halls and sees the amazing faculty and the administration and the way they love and care for these boys and girls. I see it and I see so much parental support that comes together to help these children give everything that you want for them and we want for them. So it's a, it's a great synergy that exists here. Tonight, I want to talk about uh, all things uh, mundane, like governance structures. How do we govern uh, a research laboratory school? How does it function? When I was the uh, Secretary of Education, when I was Lieutenant Governor, when I was a school principal, a middle school principal, by the way, for those of you who have middle school children, um, it's an exciting age, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the reality is that more and more of the laws were written to empower parents in the educational process. And guys like me like that. That stuff about you drop them off, we'll educate them and give them back to you at the end of the day and then at the end of the year and bring them back next year, 
worked in the United States for a long time. Too many parents, though, were either detached because they had other things to do and just trusted the educators for the education of their children, or in some cases were actually kept at arm's length by the educators regarding the education of their children. And that's not unusual, still isn't unusual today, regardless of what the laws say. But much of this has to do with how a school organizes and how a district organizes its governance structure and what a district or a, and or a school puts into place to empower people to be involved. And it isn't just parents, it's faculty members, staff members, it's interested community partners, how everyone can come together and be a part of what happens in a school community. As typical, some people have the ability, because of time, to get deeply involved and invest massive amounts of time. Other people give what they can because of their schedules, their other family commitments, their professional obligations. But it's trying to create a menu of opportunity so that no one feels as though they don't have a chance to become involved. And everyone feels a responsibility because those opportunities are there to step into their child's educational experience in some way, shape, or form. You don't have to be a research scientist to know the obvious. The children of families whose parents are involved in their child's educational experience typically are going to be more successful. Doesn't mean that a child who has a completely detached family can't overcome that and be successful on their own. But suffice it to say that it is typical that when parents are involved in some shape, some form, in their child's educational experience, that child has a much greater probability of being successful, not just academically, but if they're successful academically, probably in the way they conduct themselves and probably what they do after they finish their formal educational experience. So all things change, and one of the things we want to discuss tonight with you is a change in the governance structure for uh, A.D. Henderson. It's not uh, quite as cloak and dagger as it sounds, and uh, it's not as, uh, as sophisticated as you might think. But we look to Henderson now. You've got a new principal just coming in the door. Not brand new to the school, but new in that capacity. You have two new assistant principals, and by the way, that change alone, I really think is going to help create greater communication with faculty, with parents, with students. Uh, I have been both an assistant principal and school principal uh, and did it at a middle school. When you're talking about a school that covers uh, kindergarten on through high school, and you're saying to one assistant principal, you've got to be an expert on all of that and on every child and every grade, it's simply more than any one person should be asked to do. So there in itself is a change in what we're doing at Florida Atlantic University and what we're doing at Henderson. And I think that model will better serve everyone at A.D. Henderson. We've got a new dean uh, in the interim right now of our College of Education. Uh, Val Brister is here with us tonight, who is our interim dean in the College of Education. Um, Val is a longtime faculty member and faculty leader at FAU and has agreed, I don't know why I wouldn't have the term interim put in front of my name for all the tea in China. It's one of those nasty titles that uh, more heartache comes with interim than anything else. But she was kind enough to step up to the plate while we do a national search for a new dean of our College of Education. And we'll talk more about why that relationship is vital to this particular school uh, as we go. Uh, so you've got a number of administrative changes. We have some new faculty members at A.D. Henderson, as you know. And it really, and obviously, new parents and some new students. So there's a good opportunity here for some transitionary change that many of us have come together and believe might better serve everyone at A.D. Henderson. The whole impetus here is how can we change to create better flow of communication, better efficiency, better opportunity for everyone at Henderson. So if you'll indulge me, like all good chief executive officers do, I have a PowerPoint presentation. I promise you I'll waste the Okay? So I know these plastic chairs are hard. I'll get through this as quickly as I can. I'm glad then to answer any of the questions that you all might have. But I think this will give you a much 
uh, a more synthesized look at exactly what I'm talking about here tonight. Now, we'll start with uh, this, and that is a very quick uh, history lesson. Which button do I push? <laughs> laboratory kind of denotes something in my mind I'm not really wild about when you're talking about boys and girls, but the idea is the ability to do research. It has to be, and all this is statutory, believe it or not, all this is laid out in Florida. Florida law was created many years ago. It has to be affiliated with the state university. There are four, as I mentioned, in Florida. Obviously, FAU, uh, the University of Florida has P.K. Young, been there for many years. Uh, Florida State University is, is Thomas mentioned as the FSU a Developmental uh, Laboratory School, and then Florida A&M as a research school. All four have been around for about the same length of time, uh, decades, literally, and they were all founded pretty much on the same statutory language that was created so long ago. Uh, so there are four. The mission, obviously, research, demonstration, and evaluation. The idea is, like, as I mentioned earlier, not just to teach children. That's mission one, to make sure that the students who are in the school have the best education possible. But along with that is also to tie in with the College of Education at the university for purposes of longitudinal study, for purposes of identifying international best practice, and making certain that what you do, if it's successful, can be transferred uh, in a research-based way to other schools, to other classrooms, teachers and boys and girls. So that is the fundamental underpinning of a planetary research school. Um, emphasis, according to law, mathematics, science, computer science, and foreign language, probably no surprise uh, in any of those. I always am quick to point out, though, that as those are kind of the STEM areas, math, science, computers, uh, we don't do those things anymore without teaching them to read, write, and math, all that basic stuff that hasn't changed. 200 years of public education, so that remains the common strain. I push the button. <laughs> 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 Research mission and student democracy. I promised I would go back to this one, and it's really very important. And I'm, I've talked about that, so I'm going to jump to this. Demography. Demography means the breakdown of the people involved, or the demographics of an organization. It is very important. In order to do the kind of research that the College of Education has to do, and achieve the kind of research base that they must, there has to be a diverse demography in the school. In other words, if you are studying all one thing, you're going to get research, but it's going to be skewed to that one thing. And it doesn't matter if it's people or laboratory mice or whatever it is. You've got to have a diverse field in order to make certain that that research is valid and, again, will transfer in research fashion to other organizations uh, for purposes of their use. So when you put to together a laboratory school, again, all based in law, you must be sensitive to gender, race, socioeconomic status, academic ability, achieve through random selection of demographic categories, and admission by lottery. Let me be real candid with you and tell you that if not paid attention to, it is really very easy for laboratory schools to become boutique schools. What's a boutique school? Boutique school is located on a university campus and becomes a mecca for uh, the most affluent uh, 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 and, and the most prominent of the university community. And that isn't the idea. The idea is that it's an open population of students. And some years ago, uh, you recall, shortly after my arrival, we put in a lot of um, 
we put in a system that has, um, I, I never play the lottery uh, because I, I'd lose, but in this particular case, the idea is to make sure that we can reach in and create a diverse population of students so that we are diverse in those categories, so that we comply with the law. It's not just nice. It's also about compliance with the law. And it's also most importantly about making sure that the strategies that our faculty provide and the research done by our College of Education mesh and is sustainable and then transferable at the end of the day. And so that's why we've changed uh, the demographic mix uh, rather dramatically over the last uh, five or so years, and that's why we instituted the lottery. Please believe me, A.D. Anderson has never been a bad school. It's always been a great school. But we were committed to making certain that we complied to the law. And the law isn't just for compliance sake, it is for research sake, and it is for purposes of making sure that other boys and girls and, and faculty members in other places benefit from A.D. Henderson being part of Florida Atlanta University. Voluntary participation by subjects. I mentioned that earlier. You're here because you want to be. And, and that's critically important. If it were a zone school, you lose the function of participation. It is also important that you all know, as a part of being part of Henderson, you're a part of the research stream. Now, you can imagine if a group of FAU researchers walked into the local elementary school and said, hi, we're here to research these boys and girls. You might have a little backlash from some of the faculty, some of the parents. Everyone knows when they come here, and they're here voluntarily, that that's a part of the team that it is a research and that therefore uh, faculty members will be in classrooms, faculty members of Henderson will be engaged in some longitudinal study, and of course the boys and girls will be engaged in it all. So it's required that it be voluntary. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hard. Affiliated with the College of Education we've already spoken to and it is. Statute permits either a lab school director or principal or both. In this particular case, by law, we have both. Dr. Hodge, it's nice to say that now, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I got to shake her hand at graduation. Dr. Hodge is both the principal of the school and the director of the school. You can use both. In this case, we have one and the same. Uh, previous FAUS employed both the director and principal, as I mentioned. We've got Dr. Hodge, who is here, and the director. Chief uh, Executive Officer, she oversees the educational research and evaluation goals and programs. She recommends policy. We'll get more to whom in just a moment. And she is also accountable for financial resources, daily operations, and administration. So everything that goes on financially here, all of your audits, etc. She's the one on the hook for all of those. Uh, advisory bodies. Statute that exists actually provides that a laboratory school can establish either one or two advisory bodies. School Advisory Council. Uh, by the way, this is no different than when I was a middle school principal. I had a school advisory council in uh, Martin County at my middle school that was made up of parents and faculty and community members, etc. Reflective of the population served by uh, the school, responsible for the development and implementation of the school improvement plan. Again, I'm going way back, but no different then. We were required to put together a school improvement plan, with goals, objectives, accountability measures. What do we want to accomplish this year? Where are we going to put our resources? And it was developed collectively by the school community in that regard. Responsible uh, the, the board, school advisory board. And by the way, this is the current structure at A.D. Henderson. Responsible for general guidance and oversight, at least at the comes from the statute, meets at least quarterly, monitors the operation of the school and the distribution of monies allocated for school operations, establishes necessary policy, program, administration modifications, and evaluates the director and the principal. So at Henderson right now, we have two groups. We have an advisory group, and we have the board. I can't remember the acronyms, but we have them. And, and they have functioned for years in that capacity. I'm going to give you, before I go to the next one, a link with you. This is unique because most of you, if not all of you, are familiar with traditional school systems. Traditional school systems have the top, but the bottom is accomplished by the elected school boards who oversee the district operations. So you have the local advisory board working with the principal, and 
then you have a school board at the district level that sets policy, procedures, practices, fiscal oversight for the entire school district and all of the schools therein. In this particular case, years ago, Henderson chose the statutory model that provided to have both of those at the school site, the advisory group as well as the board, and both at one school site. Okay, and that's, that's an important notation for, for where we're going from here. Now, here are some of the challenges with having two advisory boards, and I think we've run into this from time to time, and that's one of the reasons we dusted all of this off, looked at it, and thought perhaps a new model may be in order for the future of Henderson. Lack of clarity on roles and responsibilities. Remember the two models? Uh, you have some people who are elected, some people who are appointed. You have one role that has policy setting and fiduciary responsibility. You have another group that has recommendation uh, opportunities and responsibilities. And I think part of the problem that we have faced from time to time is who reports to who, who advises, who recommends, who sets policy, who votes, and who just gets together and talks. And I think it has provided, and when I say I, I'm giving you the global eye that I get when I talk to the people in the College of Education, the people at Henderson, the parents of Henderson students, etc. Okay. Uh, demographic imbalances can sometimes occur, multiple points of contact, who do I, if I'm a parent and I've got an issue I want to talk about, who do I go to? Do I go to the principal? Do I go to the board? Do I go to the school advisory committee? Where do I go with my issues? There might be problems, just there might be an idea. Where do I take you? Uh, confusion on membership categories and classifications. And again, what we have here today are a large number of categories and classifications for parents, community members, board members. It's a long laundry list. You'll see that in just a moment. Now, the benefits of one advisory body. Remember, this is the other statutory possibility for a, for a laboratory for a developmental research school. Is instead of having two, you in essence combine them you have one. You have one governing body that works with the principal and the school community. So it is, it's a hybrid, uh, in essence, of what we have today. But it provides you a single point of contact. It provides you with greater clarity. Uh, I think enhanced accountability, because you're not wandering. You have one group that works to develop the school improvement plan, one group that sets the policies uh, of the school, one group that communicates directly with Dr. Hodge and her staff. Uh, and, and helps to evaluate Dr. Hodge as opposed to having multiple groups, sometimes with great redundancy. Uh, obviously eliminates inconsistencies of two bodies and enhanced communication. Communication is one of those words that's oftentimes overused. I happen to love the word. The biggest problem we have in our homes, our schools, our churches, our synagogues, our mosques, our, our hospitals is lack of communication at the end of the day. So while it's oftentimes overused, it is still one of the fundamental principles of a good school how people communicate with one another, how faculty communicates with students, how faculty communicates with administration, how administration communicates uh, with parents, how parents communicate with faculty. It all goes around, and of course, the boys and girls are at the center of all of that. Structural efficiency reduces organizational redundancy and overhead. Uh, again, one group meets, as opposed to having two meetings with two different groups and then trying to dovetail all of those efforts. Um, streamlined structure and procedure, demographic balance, statute requires board composition to be representative of the community served by the school. The way the statute is laid out, it's always prescriptive, whether you're talking about the two bodies or the one body. But the one body, uh, in terms of the categories to be represented, really do, which you'll see, I hope, give you a much greater balance by way of demographics and inclusion in this particular model. Uh, reduces categorical confusion, and um, you do achieve a mix of both elected and appointed membership. Uh, a school of Bay Anderson, FAU's uh, high size, is more effectively served, as we've come to believe it, with a single body. Having two for a school this size, remembering that in the Palm Beach County School District, you have one school board that serves all of the schools in Palm Beach County, we have all of that model right here at one school. So the idea is to streamline it, streamline it, make it more efficient and more effective for everyone. All right, new single advisory board. This is, this is the way it would work. And by the way, again, not made up. This comes right out of Florida statute. You 
would have six members elected by their peers. Elementary parents elect an elementary person. Uh, middle school or secondary people elect a secondary person. Student body secondary elects their uh, student body president who becomes the elected representative uh, to the board. Uh, faculty elects a faculty member and so on. Five members minimum appointed by the university president. Here's how it works. Elected members, two teachers, one elementary, one secondary, two parents, guardians, one elementary, one second, uh, secondary, again, elected by their constituencies. Not a great deal different than we do today when we elect uh, parents, etc. cetera. Uh, one education support employee from the school, elected by the other support employees at the school, and one student, as I mentioned, secondary student uh, who also happens to be the student body president. By the way, that's no different than at FAU, where one of our uh, students, the student body president, is also one of the 13 members of our board of trustees at Florida Atlantic University. So it's, it's a similar kind of a model, again, laid out in the statute. Exactly. Uh, appointed members. Each appointed member is appointed by the university president. That's the way it is now. One principal. I guess that'll be you. <laughs> One dean of the College of Education or designee. The reason we say designee is participation is critical. And since the dean of the College of Education is dean to the entire college, which means from Port St. Lucie all the way down to the Miami-Dade line, not being able to attend meetings is problematic for that individual. And rather than an empty chair, we wanted to make sure that College of Education's leadership was, was there, was represented. So we said or designee. And by the way, uh, Val will serve in that capacity, or the order designee, and when the new uh, dean comes in, we'll leave that up to the new dean. If he or she decides if they want to be that person, we're good to go with that. If they decide, well, I'm new, maybe I've got to let the, the designee do this for a while, we're good to go with that too. But participation is important to have somebody there represented. Um, two university faculty members, and by the way, they don't have to be college of education faculty. It could be a faculty member from the College of Science. It could be a faculty member from the College of Nursing. We want two people who are interested in what goes on at A.D. Henderson and want to contribute to the success of A.D. Henderson, but they don't have to be a College of Education faculty members. One business or community citizen, a representative of the ethnic, racial, and economic community served by the school. Uh, so, and there again, if it happens to be the parent of a Henderson student, great. But it doesn't have to be the parent of a Henderson student. It can just be what it says. It can be one business or community representative that I will ultimately appoint for this particular position. We go this route. Additional members may be appointed. This is important. Additional members may be appointed by the university president to achieve a representative mix of the ethnic, racial, and economic community served by the school. Whenever you're putting a board, and I'll bet there's not a person in here that hasn't served on board, been around boards, whenever you put a board together, you always have to be sensitive to the mix. You don't want a board that is all representative of one group and leaves everybody out. So this is a trap door they put into the law that allows the university president to see who gets elected, to see who gets appointed, and then to take one last look to feel comfortable that there really is cross-representation that exists on that board. It's no different than many boards are set up uh, in Florida statute to ensure that you're getting a good diversity, a good mix with the board representation. operations of the school and the 
distribution of monies allocated for school operations. None of this is essentially new and, and vastly different from what happens today. But as you can see, again, it is a blend of the two bodies, roles and responsibilities <coughs> in one body. Evaluates the director and the principal, establishes necessary policy, program, and administration uh, modifications. Transition and timeline. I want to get ahead of myself, but I want to show you what we're proposing. And then we're going to have the opportunity to dialogue. But very importantly, we're going to need the input of everyone, faculty, parents, you name it, uh, to make certain that by going this direction, it is implemented appropriately. But the system that is put in place, the idea here is, it's better than the system we are moving from, or what was the point. So this is a proposed transition and timeline. And by September of 2008, we continue the two systems. We don't want to change this system overnight. You can't just go out there and put in place a new board and say, there, that's better. It won't be. So you've got to build this thing as you go. So what we would propose is that we would continue the two advisory boards that we currently have and prepare the transition for the second semester. Using the first semester uh, to get people elected, to get people uh, to an orientation program, but we don't want to lose valuable time in the school year we've already begun for these children and the faculty, but we would continue the process that we, that we currently have and then look to implement and transition in the second semester. Uh, we would post and review uh, the proposed single body bylaws. That's very important. All of this would be covered by a system of bylaws. And before that second semester, those bylaws, and you'll see more about that later, would be posted online for everybody to see and for everybody to critique and for people to provide input about so that we could ultimately end up with a system of bylaws that would be ready to start the second semester when the new system went into place. The bylaws uh, cover uh, much of the detail that is so important to making sure that the overarching system works and works well, roles and responsibilities. Um, October, November 2008, we need to present this plan to the Florida Atlantic University Board of Trustees. They actually oversee the whole university. That includes A.D. Henderson School. And so what you've got right now is a approved function of the Florida Atlantic University Board of Trustees. So we would look to take all of this to them and those proposed bylaws that I talked about a moment ago, once they're cleaned up and everybody's satisfied with them, to the Florida Atlantic University Board of Trustees somewhere in October or November of 2008 to get them approved get ready for the second semester implementation. December, elections would be held by the peer groups. So during the month of, uh, of December, we would put out an all call for the elections, for all those positions that I uh, showed you in the membership uh, chart just a few moments ago. And during that time, we would see who was interested in being appointed to these positions. So that, again, by the end of December, we would have an appointed group, and we would have the elected group all in one, ready for orientation. This again is not just about getting a new group of people together and no doubt keeping a lot of the group that are already there. This isn't about out with the old and with the new, it's just changing the governance structure. You need some of both. But at the end of the day, that orientation for these good ladies and gentlemen is going to be critical. Okay, now you've got the job, what do you do with it when the second semester starts? What is your role? What is your responsibility? And then also making sure that everybody to the greatest degree possible, understands the roles and the responsibility of the people who will sit on this board. It is only going to work if the people on it know what they're supposed to do, and stick with that, and if the people who work with them understand what their roles and responsibilities are as well. Then implementation initiated for second semester with a single advisory body. It was only on one slide. I don't want to make it sound easy. That's a lot to do in one semester. My faculty will tell you the semester goes in the blink of an eye. My students will tell you it seems a lifetime. But my faculty will tell you it goes in the blink of an eye. In this particular case, as you can see, there's a lot to accomplish between now and January when we would start the second semester. But it's most doable. And the good news is most of it's doable because we've got people who want to make it work. Uh, people who believe in it and people who believe in the people who will ultimately be the ones that make this work. So, that is a general timeline of roles and responsibilities. Um,
gives you some flavor. Fast forward, the idea would be that everybody would come back for second semester or post-holiday break and begin with the new governance structure. I don't want to make it sound like it's just a reshuffle. It's a very important governance change. It sounds like, hey, you're just compressing two bodies into one body. They have the same job and just do it all at once. It's far more than that. And that's why they put two possibilities in the law. Out of the four laboratory schools, and somebody can help me, we have this conversation. I want to say one, how many do it with, with, I think it's two and two right now, right? So in essence, if we go this way, three of the lab schools will use this model. One student uses um, two bodies. So if, not that there's safety in numbers, I'm just trying to give you that for, uh, for some kind of context here. Uh, because I don't want you to think that this is something being down from planet Plectron. Uh, it, it is important, it is fundamentally sound, and it is our belief that in terms of what Henderson needs going forward, it's a great opportunity, not just for change for change's sake, but to put in place a model that we hope will provide greater efficiency, greater accountability, greater communication opportunities between all the people who are just absolutely critical to this continued success of AD Henders. At the end of the day, that's all that matters. But this, but this continues to be a great school, and it is. But the way we govern and the way we organize can actually help it to be a great school by using a different model and give people a chance to feel more included than ever before. Not that people didn't feel included, but give them a chance to feel more included, more empowered than ever before. Now the great news is you've got a principal slash director who is a believer. We've spent lots of time together since she got the job, and uh, she is a believer. Uh, she likes communication, number one, so this won't be a challenge in that regard, but she believes this model will work for A.D. Henderson. And you've got people in the College of Education who have bought into this and believe this model will be great for the future of A.D. Henderson. Again, some of the parents I've talked to, and some of the faculty I've talked to really seem to believe uh, that this is a great model. We don't have it in place yet. And it is only going to be as great as the people who used it. That's any model. There's no, I think we can all agree, there is no perfect governance model that exists out there. But we think in the transitionary stage of A.D. Henderson, yet yeah, the principal, assistant principal, the dean of the College of Education, et cetera, that we have a real great opportunity to continue that transition forward and continue to do the great things that we have racked up in history. So with that, uh, I want to see, uh, I've given you a lot of information, and like I'm going to do everything too fast. My wife says I'm like a carnival barker. I can't help it. Uh, I get passionate about this stuff. But I want to see if you all have any basic questions that I might be able to ask. Yes, it's hard for you. You both had a couple of slides. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 that, get your input uh, as a school before we make any final determination. 
also, is there more criteria needed, for example, the two parents, you're one elementary parent. Are you looking for anything deeper, criteria, or is it just simple as? It's a little bit like being president of the United States, 35 years of age in the United States. <laughs> in this case, you don't have to be 35. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, no other criteria, up there. Okay. And lastly, who is overseeing, like if they're not doing their job, the people that are on the board, who, whose job is that to? Ironically, the board. Um, in, in most cases, the board has a self-governing responsibility that says, and by the way, we're going to look at this for the bylaws too, if you miss X number of meetings, you know, you get a warning, and then you're off. The question is really good, but what criteria? Well, the first criteria is you have to want to serve. And I don't mean just get the job. You have to want to serve. And as you might imagine, this will require multiple meetings in the bylaws. This will require uh, lots of communication between meetings. And it's going to require that whether they're appointed or elected, they have to serve. And at some point in the bylaws, there will have to be included information regarding someone who doesn't. That, that board's ability to deal with that. I know I've been on multiple boards in my career, and almost all of them in the bylaws have a caveat that says you only get to miss so many meetings, and then after that, your membership uh, can't be revoked from the board. So much of this, and I can't tell you all of it, uh, but much of this we will try to craft into the into the bylaws in anticipation of the kind of things, those very good things that you're talking about. And lastly, do you, I know all the other ones. They're going to be in the school um, with children. We would put in place those things that are required in Jessica Lundford, and one of those is um, a background. We would do that as a full-blown piece. Yeah. Um, those are good, it's a good, easy safety check, um, and that might be, again, one of the things that's included. Yeah, the, the those folks are going to need greater access to school, and they're going to be folks who are going to be, obviously, if it's done right and well, they're going to be around all the time. I worked on that all day. Thank you. <laughs> uh, who's currently on the board of the civic system? The two boards, the business. Memberships are on the website. Yeah, I was going to say, I don't know names, but you're But is it made up of senior parents? Yeah. The short answer is boards? yes. You have on the school advisory committee or council, what you call here, which you call it? You have uh, elected parents, you have uh, elected faculty, elected support staff, community uh, representation, similar to what you see up here. The board is appointed, uh, but it's, it's the same kind of thing. So yes, what you've got really is a blend of not only the two bodies, but you've got a blend by way of membership. You can go to the assistant principal, then you can go to the principal slash director. So you're actually getting two for here. Uh, but yeah, always. Uh, I, I have found in my career, I really mean, that more often than not, the teacher can fix what ails you. Um, they may not always say yes. You know, it's a little bit like Santa Claus. It's not always yes. But uh, more often than not, most problems surrounding our children are being handled by the classroom teacher. But most teachers will tell you that if the answer doesn't satisfy you, you're absolutely welcome to go on to the next level. When you get to the principal slash director, um, she will have to satisfy you that what we're doing is a part of the policies, the procedures, the practices of the school as laid down by the board. So when I was a school principal, if somebody came to me and said, I don't like what you're doing with my child, sometimes the answer was, then you've got to take it up with the school board because they set that policy and I'm responsible for implementation of that policy. And it's not Passing the buck, that's the way a good organizational structure is supposed to operate. Somebody sets policy, administration carries out policy. Um, and, and the line of communication there is good. Where'd you come from, Brian? Brian? You got in the lottery? You know you played the lottery design? Okay, good. Yeah. Will there be safeguards on some of those broader categories to ensure that it doesn't digress to a popularity contest and you do get a fair representation of interested parties? 
it's a little like the national elections. Um, That's what I'm looking at. I wish I could tell you the answer to that was yes. Uh, but elections are elections. Uh, and at the end of the day, he or she who gets the most votes wins. The, the safeguard that's built in here is not necessarily relative to the popularity contest as much as it is the representation of the school. It does provide, as you saw before, one trap door. And that's once we look at this to make sure that the school is truly representative of the population served in the school. But no, I would venture to say that, uh, like all good parents, somebody's going to rent a truck with a PA system. And <laughs> well, are you going to just go and say, vote for me? Well, will there be some parameter to how those parents can express their interest and how they can share to their peer groups? You know, the, the answer to that is probably embedded in what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, if there has been an abuse of that, it's gotten by me. Um, most parents, typically, the way it ends up at the end of the day, ballots go out to parents, parents vote and send it back. Um, and I wish I could tell you, just like on the national scene, that everybody who votes knows exactly who the candidates are and everything about them. Um, at the end of the day, it's probably not going to be much different than what you've got. People will say, I'd like to run for that particular, whether it's the secondary position, put my name. If they decide they want to make phone calls to some of the other parents, well, now for like to do that, yeah, or email or, or text message, um, okay. yeah, they're going to be allowed to do that. The, the responsibility of, uh, of administration is to make sure uh, that the voting is clean, is accountability based, is all done in a transparent way uh, to assure that whoever gets these jobs, everybody knows they got a fair and square. Um, yeah. and Second. How about alternate in the election if somebody doesn't show up to the right amount of meetings and they're dropped? Typically, that that's a good question. Meeting? Typically, what boards do is if somebody is dropped because they don't show up to meetings or what have you, uh, we'll cover this in the bylaws, I would imagine, but typically there is a temporary appointment either. And this comes right out of your Civics 101. There's either a temporary appointment until a special election is held, or depending on where it occurs in the year, there's simply an appointment to, to fill that vacancy for the rest of the year in the regular election cycle. That's a good question. Yes? Um, as you mentioned in the beginning, the high school here is a very special school. And serving as a member of the staff, there's been past issues where <coughs> there hasn't been high school representation, and high school parents felt that they weren't being represented. And in the same case, you may have a kid that stayed here, comes only for middle school, six, seven, and eight, and is not qualified to go to high school here. So I think you may want to consider making sure with the parents that you have not only an elementary parent, but someone from the middle school as well as a high school, just to make sure that they feel that they've been represented within the board so that they're not. It, it's a good positions. point, and that's one of the reasons we want to post the bylaws for the review. Because people will look at them and say, it's fine, but I got a better idea. Um, and, and if there's enough of that, where people feel as though, for example, uh, you have uh, uh, one elementary, one middle, and one high school, so be it. But what you've got to guard against always, as you might imagine, is overrepresentation. Have you ever been on a committee that is so big you just can't get anything done? And, and there's always one other person that somebody says, you know, we ought to have on here. But you make a very good point. And that's really the reason we want to draft these bylaws and give you all the opportunity to review. You know, people are going to come up, I think, with some good ideas. It's, it's a good point. Yes, Sean? First of all, thanks for being here tonight, very eloquently as always, uh, uh, updating us on, on this. Um, streamlining for efficiencies and better communication and ultimately a better education for our children seems like a no-brainer. Um, what would be a reason why you wouldn't want to go to school? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question. Uh, you said I was the greatest president in the <laughs> <laughs> You really couldn't hear it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Um, and the question is simple. This looks pretty good. Who doesn't want greater efficiency, greater communication, etc.? What's the downside? There isn't one. Um, and I, I don't mean that to say this is the greatest thing ever. There isn't one. And, and again, I'm always qualified by saying it all depends on the people who get the jobs. It all depends on their interaction with the principal, the staff, the faculty. Does any model? is prone to break down if the people in it don't know their responsibilities and care to their responsibilities. But at the end of the day, believe me, I wouldn't be bringing this to you um, if, 
I didn't think that this was not a model worth uh, worth implementing. Did the other two research schools that have this model did they start with this model, or did they also change and evolve this model? Well, I know the one there, there's a different situation at Florida State University School, which is a charter school. So they have that's one of the reasons that they have two boards. Uh, one does the, the non-profit piece, and those governance policies, and then you have the school improvement council, which does the statutory school improvement. PK Young, and I'm probably going to have to defer to David, I'm not aware that PK Young uh, ever had a separate standalone school advisory council. It would have been well before my time. Okay, so, so, so they, it's the law, Sidney Martin law, and the, the things were tacked on during the accountability phase in 92, you remember well. I remember well. Um, basically, left that door open in part, I think, because of the way that PK Young functions so well under a singular board. Um, so, and then, and then lastly, what do you need to make this happen? Uh, well, tonight, you know, we didn't want to put anything to you tonight and say all in favor of this say aye. I mean, this is brand new. It's a new concept, uh, and while not wildly different, it's a concept we obviously believe in. What we, what we really wanted tonight from you all uh, was just a general nod if you think it is pursuing. Uh, if it is, then we will go about the business of working with you uh, to begin to educate people as to what we've got to do and see the timeline that's up there. In this room, we have members of the School Advisory Council. In this room, we have members of the board uh, who are here with us tonight. Um, and short of people throwing blue plastic chairs at me, um, which may continue, I can't tell you a little half before I'm finished. Uh, the idea is, if you all like it, we will work to put it in place. We'll work with you every step of the way to begin the process, we'll generate the bylaws, we'll post the bylaws. Uh, and again, remember the trigger point here, I'm not going to try to go back. <laughs> Somewhere back there, there was a slide that said Board of Trustees of the Florida Atlantic University. Uh, up to the point where the BOT of, of FAU says, go with that. There's still room for modification, change. There's still room for ultimately, I suppose, deciding how we don't want to do this. But what we're looking for you tonight is just at least some general consensus that this is worth moving forward with. And if so, we'll work with you in terms of uh, fast forwarding again, uh, implementation for second semester, and all the things that have to go along with that, including the bylaws, including the, um, the approval by uh, FAU DOT, including the elections, including the orientation, into the second semester. Yes, sir. As an ex-board member, we should have done this a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I hope you feel that way a year from now. But that's good. I, well, I'll be gone, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do appreciate that because you, you've been there. And, and I, if somebody who has actually been in that arena can see the basis upon which this is formulated, we know it. We just need to talk this in the back of the pretty thoughtfully done. So I, I appreciate that. Well, you let us know when you've decided what the term limits are going to be, because I think some people have a concern, especially in the past, that someone would get on the board and say, 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 whether it be a parent or whether it be someone from the university. Yeah. You know, in a normal school board, if people are elected, and if they don't do their job, they don't get elected again. So yeah. if you could forward that information to us and let us know, we'll do it a two year or a year. I think that would help some of us with our position. Best. All of that would be in the bylaws, and we have talked about the bylaws being posted by. You remember these, right? Right? We put them on the web this week? Uh, yeah, actually tomorrow. They'll, they'll all be up tomorrow. They will have to stay up late. Yeah, just got to stay up late tonight and kind of throw something together. No, no, actually, we're, actually we're, we're expecting them, I think, okay, we were talking about the middle part or the early part of October. Yeah, we had actually started to pull things together when we first started talking about it. We have an idea of maybe even tonight throwing bylaws up there. And we thought, no, it's too much too fast. Let's take this one bite of the apple at a time. But uh, the idea was to get those bylaws posted as quickly as possible. Because remember, they're just a draft. So it's not like we're saying here. We wanted to get them posted so that there could be a good give and take before we finally put them to bed. So there you go. We're faster than I thought. We should have them up really, really very soon.
without it, what's the point? Okay? I mean, I, there are, I don't know how many schools in Palm Beach for our town. And again, as I said, everybody here has a seat waiting for their child or children if they decided to go back. The idea, the concept, and I think the genius of the recent developmental research school is that it's not just another school. But the only way it's going to operate under the, it's not just the statutory provisions, but under the concept, is with a strong relationship with the university. That's the whole thing. So as we search for the new dean, one of the things that I personally uh, talk to the final candidates about is the school, uh, the school and how we relate to these schools. And one of the things that I'm looking for is a leader of the College of Education who will instill in their faculty the necessity to do research here, Still in the university, the importance of good relationship with ADMers. This should not just be a school on the campus of Florida. A school we call the Hurricanes Company. There needs to be a strong, vital link to the university. As these guys will tell you, um, there, there's an old phraseology that says, beware the patience, uh, beware the fury of a patient. Um, that relationship isn't what I want to be, but it will be. I'm not happy that it hasn't existed the way I am. I'm not the king. It's just been in education for 30 years. I do know about developmental research from the local level and the state level. The only way this thing is going to work is if this university and this school are acting in the same And that manifests itself in a lot of different ways. Research is one of those, but there's other ways the two need to blend and interact. Go further than that and tell you that I think there's greater opportunity for Henderson to work with Slavic. Uh, I think that's a fact. I, I really do. I think that that parking lot that separates these two schools uh, where children graduate from Slattery and move to the other side of the parking lot, I think well, this is a great opportunity to have a readiness program that is, wow, I mean, it's got a tremendous reputation. Um, so my son went there. Uh, to, to be a better the other face with, with this school and what happens here from a in other words, if we can't learn about how to prepare children to move into kindergarten, prepare to take on the world of kindergarten, and having these two amazing schools side by side, we're missing another golden opportunity. Not only missing it, shame on us if we do. So when I uh, speak to uh, the new candidates for Dean, that's going to be one of my priorities, is to ask them, by the way, this could be virgin territory. Remember, there's only four of these in the whole state. Nationally, I'm not sure of the proportion of scale. There's that many more percentage-wise. So uh, there's a good possibility we could have finalists for the job who said, what's a laboratory school? Once explained, uh, I, I want commitments that this thing is going to be a priority in our college of education. And, and I'll, I'll end that long answer by, by saying this. It isn't just about eight years, as I said before. We don't have a commitment to all of education by what we do and what we learn at AP University. What's the point of having a research school? And I really believe, everybody has to believe that, that you can create a great school, and at the same time, if you organize yourself right around boys and girls and interface with a great university, you can learn incredible things that will then translate to other schools where they're looking for the same answers that we are. That to me is not the opportunity. That's the responsibility of the long for the research, development research. So my hope is a year from now, if not sooner, you're going to notice a big difference in that regard. Because the guy who runs the joint is not satisfied with the idea of Any other questions? Yes, for the people that are already okay. Good. Well, that's fine. Point, point, point. Yes. For the people that are already on the board, the school board. Yes. Will those positions remain? Everybody who's on currently on the school, have, have you had uh, elections yet this year for school advisory council? The school board, not the second semester. The appointed board members will remain until the second semester. And again, it doesn't mean that some of them might not get reappointed, but yes, they will all stay. Any members of the school advisory council who are already members and become members of the school 
advisory council if there's some election that's still out there will remain in those positions until the second semester. And some of those may decide to run for the job again for the second semester. Everything you currently have in place remains in place, fixed until second semester. Yes, sir. the bylaws are in place, who provides the monitoring and the oversight and assurance that the bylaws are going to be uh, supported? There's probably more than one answer. One answer clearly is the board itself, because the board is now not only the school advisory council, it is also uh, the school board. Uh, it's, it, it is encompassing. So there will be policies set, as there always are, for A.D. Henderson School by the school board, that group. But there will also be uh, a school improvement plan and school advisory council with roles and responsibilities that will go along with that. So back to my uh, point of earlier, there is a great degree of self-governing that goes along with this thing. If people are not following the provisions laid out in the bylaws that are established for that group. There will be the appropriate officers of the board who will have the responsibility ultimately just like with the local school board or, or the county commission uh, of, uh, of uh, determining if somebody's been served because they continue to violate the bylaws under which they are required to operate. Now, at the end of the day, you've got a principal slash director who's not only a part of that body, but also has a responsibility for working uh, with the university, for working back with the board. Uh, but indeed, if laid out appropriately, Bylaws approved, the membership created, and the officers elected, and as whatever it's going to be, the president or the chair, the board, vice chair, et cetera, et cetera, that board, just like the county commission does, is responsible for governing their own activities, and if necessary, for taking action against those who violate policies and bylaws. By the way, I've been group. This is David Keen. He is not only a parent at uh, A.D. Henderson School, but he also happens to be our general counsel at the university. And he was here along with others. <laughs> very in helping to formulate some of the things that we're bringing tonight. So I'll turn to an attorney, as I do every morning at breakfast. And, uh, it's not, it's not like that. <laughs> Ultimately, if there are amendments to the bylaws, they have to be approved by the Board of Trustees. But it's absolutely the responsibility of the Board to keep its bylaws, its attendance records, its policies, all of those things. And yeah. Part of the idea of consolidating this is to create the transparency and accountability of limited confusion. So everybody knows there's one Board. Where are your minutes? Where are your bylaws? Where have they been updated? David, yeah, that, that's, that's a critical point. I showed it tonight in the audience. Uh, it isn't just about organizing the people, it is about organizing the process. This group needs to keep minutes. This, need, this, this group needs to vote on issues. Uh, this group uh, needs to keep attendance. All the things that corporate boards are responsible for doing. This group, so they mentioned, needs to have term uh, associated. So everybody knows that you were appointed from this date to this date. You can apply to be reappointed if you care to, or you can. Uh, Run for office again, but this is your official term. And all of that needs to be kept, so you don't have people serving uh, beyond uh, an appointed or elected uh, day. All of that, and, and it's a lot of work. That's why I mentioned the people who are part of this need to really be desirous of service, guys, to do it and do it well.
well is really an awful lot of work to do it right. But if done right, I think it's certainly much better. What is the name of this device? Some of you would call it uh, Frank's Bright Idea Board. <laughs> uh, is there a name prescribed to the law? Well, it will basically be the FAU Medical University School Board. Say again, I'm sorry? Board of Medical University School Board. School Board. Yeah. And that's covered also in bylaws, the name of the organization, everything. It's not quite a sexy thing. <laughs> <laughs> in terms of like, the transparency, will the board meetings be open to the public? Oh, yes. Of course. If they have course. access to the minutes on the line, or do you have to make a written request? How will that work out? Absolutely. Board needs to keep tenants, board needs to keep minutes, board needs to post their meetings and let people know when and where they are meeting. Uh, board, uh, our board uh, gives public the opportunity at the end of every posted uh, minute kept meeting, gives the public the opportunity to uh, sign up to speak or to provide input whatever they care to do. Uh, yeah, uh, it needs to operate like, like a government board, if you will. And so everything needs to be transparent. Yeah, and by the way, do it that way, while well, it sounds more complicated, it's a little better place. It's what people don't know that it typically creates the problems. Uh, if you do everything transparently and somebody complains to you six months later that you're seeing for the first time, you can say, hey, we did this. We voted, we discussed, we debated, and we agreed this is the way we're going to do this. If they don't know you did that. They've always got the opportunity to say, yeah, but you didn't ask me. How are we going to take so yes, those things should definitely be done. Transparency should absolutely be part of the game. Yeah, counselor? Okay. Just, it's always good to check with your attorney on this. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a problem? Yeah, does that say you have a TV channel like the government channel? Maybe it can be, I don't know, televised or? We do not. Uh, we have OWL TV, but uh, those of us who live on campus are the only one who get OWL TV. <laughs> Yeah, so no, we're, we don't have um, that capability at this point. I, I, we got some irons in the fire for that that may change that, but not to do some future, but that's another reason. But uh, yes, we, we, we know at some point we will have our own access to you. Yes, sir? Um, I think the one thing that impresses me about this, having been an ex board member, um, and having served probably longer than I should have, um, is that it is an elected position for the you know, you were kind enough to keep appointing me. I don't know if that was good or bad, but <laughs> so I like the fact that it is an elected position of the parents uh, because there can be no no issues. If they, now, if nobody runs against that person, that's a whole nother story. Yeah, um, and, and that I guess is the the best part of this. And again, moving from two to one in itself is not the change. Okay, so instead of everybody being elected, everybody being appointed, you have some all together, you got some elected, and some appointed. It's a governance change. But the idea is once combined, it provides, as you can see, a much broader representation of the people at the table who are all engaged collectively in the design of the school improvement plan, in setting policies for the school, working with the principal director on budget issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, speaking of budget issues, I won't go through it tonight, but we're going to work with you all to also make some budget changes uh, regarding some of the things that you've been working on, a couple of the issues. Problem. It's just the way that we work with you as a university in terms of some of your accounts, and we're going to make some changes in that regard. To more coming on that when we, when we get that one ironed out. But uh, again, we felt that the transition was coming. There's no better time than, than in the transition. If you're going to transition, transition. Uh, it's a little like pulling off a band aid. You can tug at it or you can just pull it off. And in this particular case, we've got great leadership, we've got new leadership coming. We've really got a great opportunity, I think, to transition uh, to continue a great school and make it a great school in the future again. Uh, there's that. We've got places to go, children to see. I can't tell you how appreciative I am, not only that you came out, especially this early in the school year, but how much time you gave us tonight. And we look forward to working with you every day, but according to the uh, calendar throughout the course of the entire year. It's going to be a wonderful year for 80 years. Have a great Thank you. Year.